Uh, I want to first start uh, with thanking the organization for inviting me um, for this conference. Um, and I want to start with a confession today. Um, when I got the invitation for this conference, uh, um, I found its title slightly uh, puzzling, especially the divided, uh, uh, divided societies. Uh, my puzzlement was caused uh, by the term divided society because this term presupposes uh, that there are undivided societies. And of course, I had no problem with understanding that uh, Cyprus and Korea and Germany that some time ago uh, are seen as divided societies, divided in a political sense, but nevertheless the question remained uh, what their contrast class is and what this distinction, uh, uh, why this distinction matters to uh, historians and historical cultures. Um, therefore I decided to uh, turn this distinction into the topic of my talk today and um, I will uh, tell you a bit, a bit, I promise, uh, about uh, supposedly an undivided society, the, the Netherlands, where I come from, and this is not meant to be an advertisement for the Netherlands, but I think it's uh, functional for some of the topics that uh, have been dealt with by Weber and Antonis, I at least hope so. Um, the first section of my paper will deal with a, a brief sketch of the uh, dominant Dutch master narrative uh, of consensual history. It's basically about the Dutch history, uh, uh, contemporary history and the history of the 19th century. The second section deals with the more general question, uh, what kind of conflicts historians are handling and whether one can expect them to help to solve political conflict. It was also a question which was central to Barrett's uh, talk. In the third section, I will fund fundamentally question, uh, well, the Dutch master narrative, uh, but that's not basically the point. The point is that I will uh, try to illustrate by which discursive mechanisms uh, in Dutch history the idea of consensus has been produced. And, uh, I will actually uh, argue that there are silences in uh, Dutch history, contemporary history, that break as consensus. Okay, that's the outline. Um, I have chosen to focus uh, and to start on the, uh, the Netherlands because Dutch society uh, is for a very long time being represented as a paradigm case of undivided, uh, an undivided society, peaceful and tolerant. A society that is um, characterized by consensus politics. Uh, the bulk of Dutch historians and social scientists have represented Dutch history since mid 19th century in this manner. Basically, the picture Dutch historians and social scientists uh, have painted is that Dutch society and history since Napoleon was a very peaceful and consensual affair. Uh, the only exceptions uh, to the rule were the mini-war uh, of the Dutch uh, against the Belgians in 1830, last 10 days, and the... Uh, <laughs> Easily reconciled. <laughs> yeah. uh, and the mini-war uh, uh, against Nazi Germany in May 1940, that lasted 10 days. Um, moreover, the Dutch missed all European revolutions since 1850. <laughs> Even better than the Germans. <laughs> According to the Dutch Martin narrative, conflict in general and armed conflict in particular simply was not part of the peace-loving spirit of the Dutch nation. And there is an interesting thing to this picture because the continuous mass violence that was exerted by the Dutch in their colonies was completely left out of this picture. Obviously because it did not fit in. And when the Dutch colonies entered the picture of Dutch history at all, the Dutch typically claimed to be the better imperialists, meaning the non-violent uh, imperialists. Therefore, 
There seems to be a broad consensus uh, among Dutch historians and social scientists concerning this Dutch consensus uh, basically over the 19th and 20th century. Now, where does this consensus come from according to this master narrative? Well, the Dutch consensus between 1870 and 1970 uh, was uh, attributed to the socio-cultural system, the political system, the so-called <coughs> pillarization. I don't know whether you ever heard of it. Um, I should put it on the slide if I have my time to do it. So the Dutch consensus politics was explained by the system of so-called pillarization. This system implied that most of social, political and cultural life in the Netherlands was vert vertically segmented into four pillars. <coughs> These pillars consisted of networks of coexisting Protestant, uh, Catholic, liberal and social democratic organizations. So the, the pillars of Dutch society were these four vertical columns, which were actually networks of all kinds of organizations. The leaders of the four pillars always cooperated peacefully with each other. Um, and that was the secret of Dutch harmony, uh, peace uh, and consensus. Uh, the story, this story about pillarization and what put it to the Dutch uh, stopped more or less in the 1960s and 70s because the pillars then basically broke down due to the uh, process of secularization. Uh, I mean, the churches uh, ran empty. Uh, but instead of the pillarized system, the Dutch got the so called polder model. Polder model. Uh, and the polder is. Uh, uh, Land regained from water from the sea, and uh, I don't know whether you know what polar. Uh, okay, this Dutch polar model implied that conflicts between empl employers and employees were solved by peaceful negotiations between their organized representatives under the guidance of government officials. This was the new Dutch uh, consensus formula. And in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, successive Dutch governments have even claimed that the Dutch polymer model represented uh, the solution for many uh, social and economic problems of the other European states. And I mean, they basically uh, had this idea that the Dutch could export, yeah. export the Dutch polymer model like they exported Gouda, Gouda cheese and, uh, and gold. <laughs> well, this, so far this, uh, uh, so, uh, this Dutch master narrative of a consensual history in society. This representation of Dutch society as undivided and peaceful allows me to draw the first conclusion and to raise some conceptual issues which are relevant for this conference, I think. The first conclusion from the Dutch example is that judgments concerning societal divisions and societal harmony are dependent on the way they are represented by politicians, by social scientists, by historians and by all others who forge uh, the discourse on collective identities. Although Dutch society between 1880 and 1960 has consistently been represented um, as split vertically by polarization, it was at the same time represented as undivided in politics and culture. This representation of Dutch society is peaceful and as tolerant, however, implied, as I indicated, that the mass violence in the Dutch colonies was kept completely out of the picture. Therefore, we can conclude that the consensus concerning the love of peace and tolerance of the Dutch was very much in the eyes of the beholder, or to phrase it more up to date, was an essential part of the representational code of the Dutch of themselves. This way of representing Dutch society as consensual and tolerant was shared by both the political class and the social and human sciences. Um, polarization discourse started in the social sciences and from there it migrated to the discourse of the Dutch historians and to Dutch politics. 
Um, the polar model discourse followed a different trajectory. It started in the 1980s uh, with the trade unions. From the trade unions, the discourse spread to the general political discourse, and only after that it migrated to the historical discourse and the discourse of the social scientists. Therefore, we can conclude from this Dutch example that codes and models of societal uh, representation and self-representation can and do migrate between political and academic discourses. And I'm only raising this point in order to argue that in this sense all history is public history, uh, which is another topic of this, uh, this conference. I mean, these. Uh, Codes of representation are not uh, limited to the historians and social scientists. Moreover, we can conclude from the Dutch uh, example of polarization that societal divisions can and usually are uh, overlapping with each other and are conceived of as standing in some form of hierarchy. In the Dutch case, for example, social class was represented as subordinate to the religious and the ideological pillars. So you have various kinds of divisions in society. Uh, and they are multi-layered and they stand in a specific hierarchy. And because of this overlap and hierarchy of divisions, we should always need to ask what kind of societal divisions we are talking about when we are dealing with divided societies. And I'm glad that earlier on this question already popped up because, uh, well, it's a there and it's, it may be not completely irrelevant to uh, 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 remark that in Marxist discourse this whole idea of undivided societies is of course uh, nothing less than an ideological construct, uh, except for the communist society. <laughs> the case studies in this conference clearly suggest that divisions are, here are conceived of in political and in social terms. And I think we need to clarify what kind of divisions uh, we are referring to when we use the term divided society, because if we do not, uh, the whole notion of divided society may easily uh, turn into an empty signifier, into a concept without a contrast class. So much for the conceptual clarifications concerning the notion of divided society. This leads me to the second question that is fundamental to this conference, at least in my view, and that is the question what kind of conflicts historians are dealing with if they have a specific, and the question if they have a specific historical way of handling them. This is also already dealt with by Berber, I didn't know it. Well, given the fact that South Africa, Germany, Croatia, Cyprus, and Indonesia are presented as case studies in this conference, the conflicts in case are primarily internal and external wars and their aftermath. Therefore, apparently, in this conference, we are mainly talking about violent political and military conflicts. Now, it seems important to emphasize in this context that historians, as historians, are not dealing with military and political conflicts in a direct manner, but only in an indirect manner. Professional historians only handle political conflicts if they have been transformed into conflicts historians. That is, if they, have been, if they have taken these conflicts the form of historiographical conflicts. Only by solving historiographical conflicts, historians, as historians, may contribute to solving military and political conflicts, or may, yeah, they may contribute to this, uh, uh, the, the resolution of these conflicts and to reconciliation. Because History, as a discipline, is following its own disciplinary rules. I mean, historians are also uh, citizens of court and are active as citizens, uh, but I'm talking now about historians as uh, specialists, professionals. Historians are usually supposed to contribute to reconciliation by producing historical truths, uh, I've already told that, and by deconstructing historical myths. That's what usually is the <coughs> presupposition of what historians can do. So, the, what one could call the pincer movement of historical truth is 
supposed to produce shared narratives that include all sides, are inclusive, <coughs> and have a healing effect on all sides uh, that were previously involved in conflict. Those who, optimistically, I would say, expect historians to produce shared narratives presuppose that it is possible for historians to produce historical representations that are politically neutral and that transcend political conflicts. They also, optimistically, presuppose that historiographical conflicts have better chances to be resolved than political conflicts. As was to be expected, there are also more pessimistic or skeptical among the historians. So it's no wonder that historians have fundamentally disagreed on the issue of shared narratives and their political neutrality. Again, this is an issue uh, Berber already uh, touched on. I have a different take on it. The most influential, optimistic answer to these questions has been formulated uh, by Max Weber a century ago when he claimed that all science worthy of the name is or should be value-free and objective. For Weber and all inspired by him, um, science and politics are fundamentally different spheres of value, we call them, divided by clear borderlines. Science is regulated by the values of rationality, like truth, evidence-based argument, consistency, while politics is regulated by irrational uh, values, ultimately based on emotions and decisions of the will. Because science is supposed to be rational, while politics is basically irrational, conflicts in science, including history, have far better chance of being resolved than conflicts in politics, according to this line of argument. Therefore, everybody who is following this track, and uh, uh, Barra has used the word positivists in this uh, context, um, everybody arguing along this track can expect historians to contribute to political reconciliation by producing healing truth that's binding for all. As I said, not everybody is optimistic in this sense. The, there is another pessimistic or skeptical uh, answer to the question of shared narratives and their political neutrality. And this skeptical or pessimistic uh, answer has been formulated by uh, Michel Foucault, Pierre Bourdieu, and recently by Bruno Latour. All three have argued that science and politics are definitely not separate domains that are regulated by completely different values. According to them, the value freedom and objectivity uh, of science are little else than an ideology and a myth. This also holds for the idea that science produces healing truths that are binding for all in the processes of reconciliation. All of them argue that one, for what one would call an osmotic point of view, and by this term I mean that according to this vision there is a relationship of osmos osmotic exchange between science and politics. You know osmosis from biology, I guess. <coughs> and Latour uh, has uh, a very uh, apt uh, 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 formulation of this, relation, this osmotic relationship between science and politics. He said in a provocative way, and I, and I cite, science is not politics, it is politics by other means, end of quote. Uh, Foucault had similar uh, uh, catchphrases, uh, uh, but the gist is that they argue that science, instead of being regulated by the in informal force of the better argument, as Jürgen Habermas uh, prefers to see it, science is regulated by a tactical repertoire that is similar to that of politics, uh, according to Latour at least, and also by Bourdieu. Seen in this way, historians, as historians, are always also politicians of knowledge, meaning that doing history always involves the politics of history, including the politics of time. I cannot go into it, but some of you may have read uh, uh, 
publication of Weber or Weber and me uh, on this topic, politics of time. It is obvious that, seen from this skeptical point of view, conflicts of history in history have no better chances of being resolved than conflicts in politics. If historical conflicts are as fundamental as political conflicts, then there is no reason to expect a special contribution of historians, as historians, to the resolution of political conflicts and to reconciliation. So the skeptical pessimist view leads to a very sobering view on the conflict resolving potential of history and historians. Um, I cannot really uh, argue here why I think this skeptical view uh, explains more of actual science than uh, the optimist one. I have done that uh, elsewhere. For the moment, I hope it will surface, sur it will surface that, uh, to point out that uh, historians do have a politics of time that remains fundamentally contentious. With uh, post-positivist uh, science studies and sociology of science, I think that there are good reasons to distrust, therefore, all appearances of consensus in science. With Pierre Bourdieu, I see disciplines as fields, fields with antagonistic positions. We could say disciplines are like battlefields. And on these fields, Various antagonistic players wage discipline, specific battles on each other in search of academic profits and in search of academic hegemony. In the spirit of Foucault, Bourdieu and Latour, I do not regard the absence of open uh, conflicts in science as an indication that there actually are no conflicts. Rather, I tend to see the absence of open conflict as an indication that Conflict may have been covered up or silenced. When is, under what conditions is this possible? This is possible when one of the players in a disciplinary field has achieved hegemony, has achieved a hegemonic position over others. And that's just like in politics. Hegemony itself materializes itself, uh, in the occupation of the important positions in the field, that is, the positions that determine the access to and the distribution of both the financial and the symbolic capital of the field in question. This is called uh, Bourdieu, uh, in a sense. Under what conditions is hegemony possible? Well, it's possible when there is a complete asymmetric power relationship that allows hegemonic players to clothe their power as consensus. And you can close your power as consensus uh, by ignoring and or silencing competitive players, subaltern competitors. Uh, you can silence them or ignore them, ignore them when they try to question the existing hegemony. Subaltern competitors typically do so, challenge the existing hegemony, by trying to start discussions about hegemonic views and by challenging and trying to subvert them. Therefore, I think it makes good sense to view with Latour and with Bourdieu to view academic discussions as disciplined and thus as regulated conflicts. For hegemonic players entering a discussion with, compet uh, with comp uh, competitors always implies a risk because, in theory, entering a discussion with competitors uh, may imply that they will lose a battle, although they are only hegemonic when they usually don't lose battles. But entering a discussion is taking a risk for hegemonic players. So this Risk in itself is a good reason for hegemonic players in science and in the field to avoid, uh, uh, to avoid discussions and to ignore uh, and silence competition when they start discussions. And um, I want to argue that uh, 
there are discursive mechanisms in play uh, that are in use in order to uh, maintain hegemony for a hegemonic player and discursive mechanisms that lead to uh, uh, the silencing of uh, competition. And the reason that I uh, bring these up are that I think although I give, demonstrated these mechanisms uh, in, in, in this paper and elsewhere, with Dutch examples I think uh, the mechanisms uh, uh, are not specifically Dutch uh, and that they are specific for uh, discipline of history. Oh, well, uh, strong, strong time management. <laughs> well, um, yeah. Um, then I will have to cut. Uh, yeah. Well, I, uh, what I would like to do, uh, if time allows it, uh, is to um, illustrate how these mechanisms work in practice. Um, I will distinguish three of these discursive mechanisms that help to explain the appearance of fundamental consensus uh, and that explain the absence of open, uh, uh, open discussions in Dutch history, but there's also, also other fields. The first uh, discursive mechanism that helped to create the appearance of consensus uh, of the history is the derangement of discussions by means of repetition, negation, and displacement. I will show you, they will explain what I mean by it. These are mechanisms that are in use in uh, discussions or attempts at discussion. Repetition, what is it? Repetition simply means, uh, or boils down, to repeating one's own point of view uh, instead of giving an answer to a critical question. And for instance, uh, when a non-hegemonic player challenges uh, the hegemony of uh, the hegemonic uh, party um, for its conception of, uh, of history, <coughs> arguing that the, con the conception of history is debatable or the conception of science is debatable, when the answer often uh, um, is by the hegemonic uh, party, I'm following the his scientific method. So basically, repetition of uh, the old point of view uh, and ignoring uh, the question. Uh, this, well, in my paper I have elaborated uh, on basis of the Srebrenica uh, report of the Dutch uh, New York Commission, uh, how, 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 how they silenced, let, let's say, uh, criticism on the. Um, on its methodology, so that, that, would be an, uh, that would be an example. Negation, what is negation? Negation is a discursive mechanism that boils down to a simple denial of the scientific legitimacy of the critical questions asked. The most used tactic uh, in this case is countering uh, a critical question by positioning these questions outside the borders of the discipline. Uh, and that's usually done when uh, historians say, well, this question is not a scientific question, it's not a historical question, but it's a political question, or it's a moral question, or it's ethical, ideological, and in history uh, also the label theoretical may do the job. At the same time, reflections on the uh, borders of uh, the, the field of history are labeled as meaningless, sterile, religion, etc. This is also a, dis a discursive strategy that has been used in uh, discussions on uh, the Srebrenica report. When you, uh, when you negate the legitimacy of uh, questions, of critical questions, in this manner, you simply say, I don't need to answer them because they are not on my plate. They, they are outside of the discipline. Uh, displacement is uh, the third, uh, or is an discursive mechanism and that boils down to the blocking of critical questions by transforming them into different ones. 
um, which has as an effect that one, uh, by transforming the question into a different one, one neutralizes it and also uh, doesn't uh, address it. Um, I can give you one example uh, again of the Dutch historians that wrote the Srebrenica uh, report. Um, when critics argued that the Srebrenica report was fully in line with the official version of the Dutch government, uh, the chair of the commission denied that the report was political and denied all political influences on his commission and the report. And this was remarkable in itself because uh, uh, the report was, had been monitored by the, by the government and there was a real commission installed. Uh, nevertheless, this commission claimed full scientific independence and that was the end of the story. Um, and this implied that the question for the, uh, the political dimensions of, the, uh, of, of this report was simply uh, denied. Was, uh, the argument was uh, we were, uh, um, although paid by the government, we uh, did not uh, uh, follow the government. Uh, and the more interesting political issue, and that is that the very fact that this report uh, was assigned to a, a commission that was the major political decision of the Dutch government because the alternative would have been parliamentary inquiry into this, uh, in, in, into this uh, issue. And with parliamentary inquiry, uh, inquiry commissions can uh, uh, investigate everybody uh, under oath and uh, that was seen as a, as a risk. So therefore, the Dutch government preferred historical truth of the Srebrenica Commission to a quasi-judiciary uh, investigation by the Dutch Parliament. Um, I have time for me. Um, let's, let, 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 let me go to the uh, third uh, discursive mechanism uh, and then uh, stop. Um, the first, the third and last discursive mechanism that affects silencing uh, I have proposed to call the production of silence by the production of volume. That may sound uh, a bit uh, strange, but in plain English it boils down to the rule if you can't battle them with your brilliance, bury them under your shit. Uh, commissioned history as a genre can be seen as a pure application of this rule, although this does not imply that specialists contributing to the genre have the intention to realize this effect. Intention on action is not necessary here because the form determines the content. It is the sheer format of commissioned history that usually does the trick. Whenever governments are interested in commissioned history, and that's when they are facing problems they want to have uh, removed from the political agenda, they always finance a team of experts for several years. The almost inevitable result of this format are multi-volume reports that divide even the most diligent and interested reader because of their sheer volume. The Srebrenica report consisted of four thick volumes and a large number of appendixes, totaling uh, 6,600 pages. Uh, there has been one critic who has calculated that conform the reading norms uh, that are used at Dutch universities, a uh, reader would need at least 40 weeks to read the report. I mean, the first reaction to the report were already circulated uh, well, on the spot after a week. Or take the report of the Swiss Berger Commission on the role of Switzerland in the, uh, during the Second World War. Uh, published in 2002, that report consists of 25 volumes plus a schusbrief consisting of 11,494 pages, which uh, an average reader uh, would need two years to, uh, uh, to read. Nobody has even claimed to have read the report. Nevertheless, this, these, um, these reports are <coughs> literally unreadable, and that's not accidental, I think. The function of the production of uh, volume in commissioned history uh, is dual, I think. The first 
and then I'll stop. Uh, the first function for politics is the removal of a contentious issue, such as the responsibility of a government or a state for uh, usually mass violence in the case of Srebrenica, uh, political responsibility uh, for the mass murder there. It removes the issue for at least five years. So, uh, commission history affects uh, the, postponed, the postponement of a political very hot potato. Uh, this leads to a situation in which people who uh, can be held responsible for the uh, political hot potato uh, to move on to other offices. Uh, usually, by the time the report uh, is presented, uh, the uh, politicians responsible for uh, whatever problem there was uh, are no longer in office and cannot be held responsible. Um, usually, this takes four to six years, and usually in the reports it is acknowledged that some of the actors, political actors, uh, have made mistakes, but always with the best intentions, and there was no, uh, um, well, no plan, no plan to uh, uh, do the things wrong, of course. The second effect of the production of uh, volume is that by the time the report is published, political and public interest in the contentious issue has dwindled dramatically, usually, because of the distance in time. So, here there is a, well, it's difficult not to see this uh, uh, cynically. Um, although most commissioned reports are assigned uh, by governments uh, because officially they are supposed to deliver the facts for the informed and def uh, for the informed and responsible political discussion. What actually follows their publication is usually, uh, well, small discussion or a deafening political silence. Also because few are in the position of reading them. So, objectively seen, uh, reports of Commission history fulfill a similar function as books that are bought to display them on the coffee table. In both cases, the intention to read is lacking. This, of course, does not make them useless, but can even say to the contrary. Uh, so much for my talk today, which was too long. Sorry. <laughs>